evolution really is one of the prime perspectives, let's say, because it's a worldview. How we view our past evolution is going to really be the foundation of how we view our future. And so, you know, the the general consensus, and what I what I mean by consensus, I mean your the, the um, orthodox scientific consensus is that evolution is really um, basically a, a, a random accidental event and from the primordial soup we just have the arise of, of complex organisms and we have this Darwinian evolution by um, you know, genetic inheritance and, uh, and mutation which brought us to where we are now which more or less tells us that life on this planet is an accident we are living on a rock hurtling through a dead space and you know there's no meaning to life well if that's if that's the general view then you can't really criticize all these people by who want to say well life's meaningless we hear by accident we've got to make the best of it and therefore humans have the right as a dominant species to basically take over the planet and um, mold it to their means. If, if evolution is, that, is your perspective, then you can kind of see where this grab all, every, every man for himself, if you get to the top you deserve it type of mentality comes from. If you look at evolution really, my own perspective, Greg, my personal perspective is that the evolution um, really is also about the evolution of consciousness. The songs are uh, very um, topographic. It seems to me that they're like traveling over a surface, describing a surface, or bringing the people who are listening along on that particular surface. And so they don't change wildly. They're kind of like chants, but not, but they're very fluid at the same time. And I'm generalizing about them, and each one has a different quality. But um, they're conceived of, some of them, as being actually the song of the spirit of a particular species of plant or animal or magical being. Um, and so it's, a, it's kind of a song of identity. And by singing the song that has been given to you, usually in either handed down or given to you in um, a medicine trance, uh, then you are, you have made, understood that this, this being that this song represents is acting as an ally for you. And by singing the song, you're bringing in that ally to help understand or help do whatever it is the task is to do. It's very much based on the idea that there's work to do here in the world, that we have a lot of work to do, and that um, every time you go into ceremony, part of the uh, purpose is to do some piece of the work and um, so the sharing so so they're also like tools they're like very very refined tools that can be sent across the room sometimes even to a particular person and sometimes sort of spread out like a blanket over everybody um, sometimes there's songs that protect because something is felt to be outside that we want to keep outside you know The best things can't be told. The second best are misunderstood. The second best are misunderstood, says Campbell, because as metaphors poetically of that which cannot be told, they are misread prosaically as referring to tangible facts. The connoted messages are thus lost in the symbols and elementary ideas in local ethnic inflections. Um, Inevitably, in the popular mind, where such metaphors of transcendence become known only as represented in the rituals and legends of the local mythologically inspired control system, the whole sense of the symbology remains locked to local uh, practical aims, and so forth. And then he goes on, uh, for some reason which I have not yet found anywhere explained, the popular unenlightened practice of prosaic reification of metaphoric imagery has been the fundamental method 
of the most influential exegetes of the whole Judeo-Christian Islamic mythic complex. In other words, what he is saying is that in Judaism, Christianity and Islam, we have taken the lowest of all low roads in terms of interpreting the mythic contents of our religions. The lowest of all low roads. That's my expression, but I rather think that Joseph would agree. Uh, the idea of the virgin birth, for example, is argued as a historical fact, whereas in practically every mythology of the world instances have appeared of this elementary idea. American Indian mythology is abound in virgin births. Therefore, the intended reference of the archetypal image cannot possibly have been to a supposed occurrence in the Near East in the first century BC. The elementary idea likewise of the promised land cannot originally refer to a part of this earth to be conquered by military might, but to a place of spiritual peace in the heart to be discovered through contemplation. Creation myths furthermore, which when read in their mystical sense, <coughs> might bring to mind the idea of a background beyond time, out of which the whole temporal world with its colorful populations has been derived, when read instead historically, only justify as supernaturally endowed the moral order of some local culture. In short, the social as opposed to the mystical function of a mythology is not to open the mind, but to enclose it to bind the local people together in mutual support by offering images that awaken the heart to recognitions of commonality without all, all, allowing these to escape the monadic compound. A transformation of language into something which is no longer sound decoded by brain through the consultation of a culturally uh, 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 validated dictionary, but instead it becomes sound which is beheld and meaning which is beheld. And this idea of a visible language when it first came to me or when I first realized that that was the phrase I was going to have to use to describe what was happening, I had never heard or imagined of such a thing. But then I went back into the literature and I discovered that, uh, as usual, the Greeks got there first, or at least in this case, the, the Jewish Greeks or the Greek Jews, because in philo Judaeus who was a contemporary of Christ, there's a discussion of what he calls the more perfect logos. And he says, the more perfect logos will be apprehended through seeing, not through hearing. And yet it will cross from being heard to being seen without ever going through a noticeable moment when it shifts from one modality to the other. Actually, I never would have predicted this, but I find myself um, drawn to the role of initiator. I want to have that role for people because um, you have to be taken by the hand and shown, um, and it's not readily available. You have to, you have to be shown. Uh, modern dynamics is that it's based on the idea of attractors. <coughs> Systems are attracted towards states which, from their point of view, lie in the future. So these morphic attractors, which are the basis of the kind of dynamical models, including in chaotic dynamics, that are emerging now. And so that gives the idea, as morphogenetic fields have to have, as the idea of con containing the goal or form or final state of something within themselves. The morphogenetic field of the oak tree contains, in some sense, the form of the full, fully formed oak and draws the growing seedling towards it. This is like the Aristotelian system of final causes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it, the entire nature of morph, uh, morphic fields is to have attractors. Is what the, is the, and the only way to model them mathematically that we, can, that we have something that hints towards it at the moment is in terms of 
dynamics, including chaotic dynamics, uh, the idea of non-stable endpoints or dynamic endpoints. And if one has a model of the universe based on those, and if one has also, as one does in this kind of organismic holistic universe, the idea that the microcosm mirrors the macrocosm, that the part, in some sense, mirrors the whole. So each system in some rela is in some way related to the whole. Then the morphic field of the entire universe must have a kind of cosmic attractor from that point of view, which is drawing the universe towards something. So that instead of this would then, you see, lead to the view that even the flux of energy has another side to it, because we normally think of the Big Bang pushing matter out from behind. The, the, the few, everything being pushed from the past. And the Big Bang is certainly that model is an explosion. It's the original impetus of the explosion, which is pushing the galaxies and the whole universe apart. Um, but the idea of an attractor is that it's not being pushed, it's being pulled. There's going to be a huge rise in people coming online in the next decade. In fact, perhaps uh, a billion more minds coming online. But where are they going to be coming from? They're not going to be coming from the West because most of the West is already connected to a large degree. They're going to be coming from the developing world. Developing world of young minds with greater necessity, more inclined to out, uh, without a box of disruptive innovation, trying to solve problems which they need and which the West perhaps isn't solving. Now, that is going to be a good indicator of distributed, disruptive innovation coming up. It's a wonkivator. An elevator can only go up and down, but the wonkivator can go sideways and slantways and long ways and back ways and square ways? ways and front ways and any other ways that you can think of. It can take you to any room in the whole factory just by pressing one of these buttons. Any of these buttons. Just press a button and see, you're off. And up until now, I've pressed them all. Except one. This one. Go ahead, Charlie. Me? There it goes. Hold on tight. I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen. Faster, faster. If we don't pick up enough speed, we'll never get through. Get through what? Aha. Uh -huh. You mean we're going up and out? But this room is made of glass. It'll shatter in a thousand pieces. Who will be cut to ribbons? Probably. Hold on, everybody.